Good morning, Sterling Grace Community Church. Happy Father's Day 2020. Father, Dad, Daddy, Papa, Pop, whatever term you use for endearment for this important person in your life, today is a big day in celebrating a special man. Exodus 20 verse 12 says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Today, quite a few people are trying to extend life by attempts to practice this. Good luck. Are we honoring our Father also, the Heavenly Father? Each one of us has an earthly Father to respect and celebrate today. But we also are supposed to honor, celebrate, and be incredibly thankful for the Lord Almighty, who is, as Jesus told us, our Father who art in heaven. Pastor Roger Hall has a Father's Day message for you today, and we are praying that you are blessed in listening and following the words of this incredible Father. Enjoy your Father's Day, and don't forget to honor them. But even more importantly, especially honor the Father in Heaven. Welcome to Sterling Grace Community Church. This is Father's Day, and we want to celebrate fathers and grandfathers today. Fathers, we want to celebrate your relationship and influence on children, grandchildren, and all people you meet. This is a joyful celebration. Just as Mother's Day is <clears throat> a special and extremely important part of our year, and mothers pay, play a special and important role in our children's lives. Dads also play that kind of role in a different sort of way. So today we want to honor dads and dads of dads. And men, I'm going to be fairly blunt today. We're going to talk about how to man up to be a, the man and the, the father that God wants you to be. Because we get a lot of information about temporary societal norms that have nothing to do with being a godly man and a godly father. So how do you achieve a goal for the benefit of your children of being a good father? Well, how do you achieve any goal? Let me pass on some advice some years ago from Bob Richards. Who was Bob Richards? <clears throat> Bob Richards was a brethren minister who at one time was associated with the Christian college I went to. He used the athletic fields there to train for the Olympics. He was an athlete. He set the record for pole vault and also won the 10 event decathlon in the Olympics. He was a gold medalist and worldwide was probably the most famous American athlete in the world. In late 1958, so some years ago, he was the first athlete to appear on a Wheaties box. Maybe some of you older folks remember the athletes portrayed on Wheaties boxes. Well, Bob Richards was my uncle's pastor, and as a young boy, after attending his church with my uncle's family, where Bob Richards preached, we had lunch with him at my uncle's house. There he was, Bob Richards, the biggest athletic star of his time, took me out one-on-one, -on -one, just he and me, to learn how to throw baskets with a basketball. For a nine or ten-year-old boy, that was quite an event, and I, have, I can still show you how he told me to toss those baskets. Here's what he said about his phenomenal worldwide athletic success. This is how he achieved his goal. He said, you are what you think. You are what you go for. You are what you do. You are what you think you are. Now as to being a father or a grandfather, you need to have your brain wrapped around God's word. You need to be filled with the spirit and knowledge of God because you are what you think. You need to go for it. You need to go for what it takes to be a Christian father. You need to decide that raising your children as in a Christian home is your top priority. 
You are what you do. You are with, are you with your children at church and are you a leader in their youth groups? Are you leading devotions in your home every day or every evening? You will be what you think you are. Are you going to fill your life with faith or are you going to put a second or third in your life what is competing with God in terms of who you think you are? Bob Richards also had another statement. He said, you've got to discipline your life. No matter how good you may be, you've got to be willing to cut out all of your life, those things that keep you from going to the top. <clears throat> now, you may have a very good opinion of yourself. But you need to cut out those habits or interests or diversions which block you living the Christian faith with your family. In faith, the Bible tells us that you are the hope of glory. You are the instrument that God uses here on earth. You are one of the only hopes for your children in glory. And here is the point. What is keeping you from being the godly father God wants you to be. Whatever it is, have the courage to cut it out of your life. What takes you away from your family? What bad habits do you have that are affecting your children? Do other interests and purposes or even your job remove you from being with your children enough to prevent you from giving evening devotions? Is there something else? Perhaps school sports events prevent your children from making it to Sunday worship or a midweek Christian youth group. I've run into that as a pastor. Get rid of that. Know your goal for, your, for godly children. Cut out those things that stop your children from growing in Christ. Well, we are told uh, to be a joyful father or grandfather to delight in our children and we want to delight in our grandchildren. And as Christian fathers and granddads, we can have real joy in our children and our grandchildren. If your joy in Christ rubs off on your children, they will see something very special and different in you. They should see God's love and concern working in your life. Most likely they will later emulate those Christian qualities. And because of the great love of God and eternal hope, the results of a generation of a family not being in faith is a, is a catastrophe for those born into the future families with no love of God and who have no Christian faith. If the generations of the faithful in a family are broken by one generation, it may be the end of the Christian faith in that family for generations to come. Listen to the words of the chorus to a song, Let the Circle Be Unbroken. It is a song, by the way, about a death of a parent. The chorus is, Will, a, will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by, there's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Let the circle be unbroken. What are they talking about? They are talking about not breaking the continuity or the handing down of faith from one generation to the next generation. That's a parent's responsibility. Men do not be responsible for that eternal blunder. As believers, we trust the Lord. We know that we will be together again in heaven. But we also rem need to remember the flip side of that. Those not in faith will not be there. Perhaps we need our, to ask our children, where will you be? Or maybe we need to ask a dad, where will you be? And there are penalties for not carrying on the faith. As to fathers who are not raising their children or conducting their homes in faith and scripture and in the love of God, we are told in Exodus 20, verse 5, 
For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But to those dads who raise their children in faith, verse 6 tells us, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Well, fathers have a great responsibility to their children. The good news is that God loves us and wants us to draw close to him as a family to benefit from his love and blessings. I think it's important to fathers to, for fathers to remember that fathers are the spiritual head of the household. God has delegated them that responsibility. There are at least 100 verses in the Bible designating the husband as the head of the household. You see, God designed families that way. And you wives are one flesh with your husband. So you're very, very important. Matter of fact, we husbands couldn't do a lot of this without you. We read in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, <clears throat> For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Men, regardless of what modern culture teaches you, you are the spiritual head of the household, just as Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So men, you need to step up to the plate and be that person who leads your family daily in devotions and as a living example of Christian faith. This role has been given to you by God. It's been given to you and not to someone else, not even the church. Use your church, but don't rely on the church to do your job of training of the training of your children in the admonition of the Lord. No one else can do it in the way that you can, and no one else will do it in the way that you have been commanded to do it. And if you delight and have joy in the Lord and teach joy in the Lord to your children, they should continue to follow the Lord. Scripture says, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's in Proverbs 22, verse 6. Psalms 37, verse 4 tells us to take delight in the Lord. It says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What are the desires for your children? God will give that to you. Now, those who do not believe, or only profess to believe, or have some semblance of believing, never look upon faith as a joyful thing. To them it is service, or duty, or necessary custom, but never pleasure or delight. Going to church is a burden to the non-believer. Raising children in the true admonition of the Lord would be a burden to them. Their heart wouldn't be in it. But to the believer... Christ's joy overflows into interesting and exciting relationships, parenting, and opportunities to serve others. What we are talking about here is the ecstatic Christian who can't wait to speak of things, the things of God to others and to share the good news. And it is the good news which contains the secrets of happiness, wonderful family life, and the strength to face life's most difficult problems. If you don't think so, you have not read through the Bible. You see, our faith is a joy and a hope, and it is also produces a positive confidence that God is with us in life. Our families then know that God is in control of our futures for our good, no matter what we face. God is their protector and becomes their protector and their refuge. And God has a plan for their welfare and their prosperity. We know that from the book of Jeremiah. There's security for our children in that. And that's important. And such is the joy of the Lord. It literally transforms lives. Yes, in Christ our lives are full of joy. And when we undertake to parent, 
to be a father or to have an influence as a grandparent, we do so with an unspeakable joy and happiness and a deep love for our children and grandchildren and for our Father in Heaven. The Bible says that they will know we are Christians by our love. That seems to be the bottom line test of a Christian. So parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and even adult friends, you have an, an important role to play in young people's lives that can leave a lasting impression of Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, Christ uses you. You are his hope that you would pass on the faith. So it is Christ in you, the hope and glory. And it is a positive influence that will leave young people with a sense of well-being and confidence in themselves. Not too much pride, but confidence in themselves and a sense of being loved, both by you and by God forever. So I think the point of this sermon today is be a biblical dad. Well, how do we do that? <clears throat> well, the Bible points out a number of things about being a dad. And it starts with your home and your marriage. It says, husbands, love your wives. For dads and children, honor your mother and father. Discipline your children. Also provoke your child not to wrath. And then it goes on to tell us a way to do that. Keep yourselves and your children in church activities and associate with other Christians and ministries as a family. That makes a big difference. So let's look at the first one. Fathers, husbands, love your wives. If you have a Bible, look at Ephesians 5, starting in chapter 25. I'm going to read it here. It goes on for a while, but... I want you to listen to this very carefully because it incorporates human love, but it also incorporates deep love, and it also incorporates the need for us to wash our spouses in the Word. In other words, to be reading the Bible and knowing Scripture. And let's listen to what is written. Husbands, Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water, washing of water by the word, that's scripture, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And that's the end of these verses. Can you see the safe, secure, and amazing environment for children which is created by this passage, if it's followed. Following this verse by washing the wife and also the children in the Word of God and loving them more than you love your own body is a loving environment full of God's loving values. And you know, if a family is washed with the Word of God, that family will be full of respect and a safe place for children to be raised in the love of Christ 
and in the Word of God. What could be better? But remember, men, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. At difficult times, this may be a matter of decision rather than emotion. But God will bless you both, you and your children, and return your love to you. You know, there are many other lessons in Ephesians 5, such as walk in love as Christ also loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. If you're a Christian, you're going to exude something. Here it's called an aroma. Let me ask you men, does your family view you in this way? Is your sacrifice of yourself to God and to each member of your family obvious to them? Do you have the aroma or the countenance or the lifestyle and speech of a Christian that is someone who is set apart in God? In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 and 10, it says, For you were once darkness. Notice it doesn't say you were in darkness. You were around sin. It says, you were once darkness. You were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. You see, a dad needs to be that kind of father to his family. When children see their dad walking in darkness, they know it. When children see their dad or another person walking in the light of the Lord, they know it. You can see it. You can see it in their walk, their countenance, their voice, in, their, in the sparkle in the eye, in the way they discuss life. It is exhilarating and wholesome to be around people like that. And when dads are not living in the faith, their children know it. They see it clearly. And now for all of, all of us, both adults and children, we come to the second point of the Bible. Honor your father and mother. Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And that is a commandment with a promise. God is promising long life to those who honor their father and mother. And in the New Testament, we have the similar promises made in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. It says, <clears throat> Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for that is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long. On the earth. Have you ever seen or met people who are very critical of their parents? Very critical and sort of bitter about their mother or their father? Well, that makes that complainer very bitter and angry, and those are very toxic emotions. It is no wonder that those who honor their parents in a positive way are positive people who are healthy and live long lives. That is God's promise to you. But moms and dads, we need to live lives that can be honored. Parents are always modeling their good behavior or their bad behavior before their children. It is very clear to others. So to honor your mother and father, speak well of them. That makes more it makes it more you know, by the way, it makes it more likely, parents, that if you're doing that about your parents, your children may do it for you. Third, discipline your children. Well, we read in the Bible, he who spares his rods hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Now, there's a social debate today about using the rod on children. Spank your children today and the court system will probably take them away from you and put them into foster care. However, it seemed to work for many thousands of years. Commentator John MacArthur, I got a kick out of this. He said uh, that without the rod, we are raising a nation of criminals. Well, we know also that there are other ways to discipline. We need to be more thoughtfully 
tailoring our discipline to the conduct being addressed. Now, I knew, grew up knowing very well what a spanking was, <laughs> and I'm sure I deserved them. Although normally it only took a word or a look to let me know that I had a problem. And uh, I also remember some events where a quiet conversation actually from my dad on the topic of my bis misbehavior was by far the most effective and long-lasting correction that I needed. Dads keep children safe through giving good advice and godly advice on behavior. We just need to remember that we need to accomplish the purpose of discipline and not appease parental anger. Discipline always needs to be for the correction, for the edification or building up, accountability, and the benefit of the child. So today we have to be much more creative in the use of consequences for bad behavior. And the best thing is to proactively instill knowledge of God's call for godly behavior. And I said godly behavior, just not being good. If children have godly behavior, you won't need to worry very much about bad behavior. We knew in the military that if you want appropriate conduct by your troops, you proactively train people for that conduct. It only makes sense. <clears throat> Another point was provoke your children not to wrath. But there's more to that Bible verse that we need to pay attention to. It's found in Ephesians 6, verse 4. It says, And you fathers, happy Father's Day, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Now we need to ask ourselves, how do fathers train their children? What does that mean? And how do fathers bring them up in the admonition of the Lord? And this is an involved, continuous task that lasts all the days that we are in contact with our children. You know, there may be dads listening to this who never did any of this as their children were growing up. Never give up. It's not too late. Let them know about your joy in the Lord and how it's changing your life. And encourage them to do likewise. Again, we see the call to fathers in this verse. <clears throat> to raise up their children in the training and admonition of the Lord. We need to tell dads that it is time to step up to the plate and be the men God requires them to build the kingdom of of God here on earth through his family. It does not necessarily mean you don't do this by giving your children well-rounded social activities or by spending a great deal of money on them. It does not mean that you teach them the world's values of vague, ever-changing culture and morality. Yet you, it means that you train them up in the Lord, in the admonition of the Lord. And God can really deal with your children once they are immersed in God's love and God's word. A friend of ours at church gave us a bumper sticker. It said, when I work, I work. When I pray, God works. Allow God to work in your children's lives. And one of the very best things dads can do is have a daily time of family devotions in the Word of God and to have prayer. And make it a time for children to look forward to. That means you need to plan in advance. Perhaps our children's resources or songs or books about great Christians and the Bible itself. Talk about life application of these principles. So make it a time for children to look forward to. And that means you need to plan it in advance and think about what you're going to present 
to your family. Dads, this is your main ministry. You know, when my father passed some years ago, at the memorial service, an uncle stood up. Uh, he had married into the family, and he spoke about one thing that impressed him about the family in which my father was raised as a child. My father had told my uncle, he had also told me, that, that his father, my grandfather David Hall, led devotions in the home every night. My uncle said, think about that. He did it every night. His children studied the Word of God and prayed together for everything that they were concerned about. With each, They prayed with each other every night of their 18 years at home. What a foundation of faith. No church, by the way, can do that. Think about the impact on young lives. And I would say, think about that as an influence on generations to come from that family line as the faith is perpetuated generation after generation. Dads, this is your responsibility. Wives, please support your husbands in this. Men, don't be a gatekeeper, a gatekeeper at the door of your home that keeps out the Word of God and God's influence in your home. You need to bring God into your home so that God can be working in the lives of your children and in your marriage. We know, for example, that the Bible tells us to meditate on His law day and night. And Deuteronomy 6 talks about fathers and grandfathers. It says, now this is the commandment. This is a commandment. The statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it. So that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all of his statutes and commandments which I commanded you all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. You're going to be blessed by this. Then it goes on to say in verse 6, These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Well, that's quite a commandment. So dads, dropping your kids off at church is not where your responsibility ends. You are to be teaching your sons and grandsons and daughters and granddaughters not only the word of God, but the fear of God, meaning reverence for God, a love of God, and a godly lifestyle. It says, you shall talk with them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. I remember that my dad shared his biblical values, mostly not in a formal setting. And he shared scripture with me in the same way, but when we were working on our orange groves that I was raised on, or when we were doing a project together. You must speak to your children about God whenever you are with them. Just make it part of your normal conversation. And if you are truly in the Lord and love the Lord, you will want to talk about it. It will come up. A fifth way of being a biblical dad is keep yourselves and your children in church activities and associate with other Christians as a family. The writer of Hebrews told us not to forsake the assembling with each other. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another's love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, the day is going to draw near, and those little children are out of your house. 
and the time will be so short. You will actually mourn that, I think. And also, the day is near when our lives end for one reason or another. It's part of life. And don't miss out on that opportunity to influence your young ones. Now, Christian fellowship is part of the Christian walk for many reasons. And, and also, don't put your family around ungodly people who do ungodly things, speak ungodly thoughts, or approve of ungodly things. That is so common today. You may need a new set of family friends. Because these people, in their ungodly ways, are influencing your children in the wrong way. So parents, be in Christ. Learn all you can about God and live out your faith. This means that church and Christian activities, service and Christian knowledge need to be a priority in your life. It is more important than anything else. And let me ask you parents a question that may seem like an odd question. Are your children so active in youth ministry that they are demonstrating their own faith an example in ministry? Are your children examples of the Christian faith? Is that too much to expect? I don't think so. Children have amazing capabilities and thought processes at young ages. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote to a young man, Timothy. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. Here's what he says. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you which is, was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear, hear you. So young people, you have a ministry now. You are to be a, an example of Christian living and purity in your life. Youth, you are the church of today as well as the church of tomorrow. Moms and dads, God expects your children to be a Christian example of others now. If your children are not, why not? Men, what do you need to do now to get your family and children living in their faith? It is up to you. You are the spiritual head of the household. So young people, make your parents proud of you by your speech, your conduct, and your faith. Who you are reflects on your you and your family and your church family. And we know from Proverbs 23, verse 24, that the father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. Proverbs 10, verse 1 says, A wise man, excuse me, says a wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. And as to dads, dads, Long after you are gone, your descendants will wonder who you were. You may be so many generations back that they will never have seen you or met you. And as a few generations pass away, who will be left to remember your life and legacy? Your main legacy will be the faith you instilled in your children and all of their descendants who have faith because of you and your example and your faithfulness to God. If you are in faith, 
I believe that someone will tell your story or write your story. Your spiritual legacy matters. Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Well, we want to wish all you fathers and grandfathers um, a very happy Father's Day. We're praying for you. If you're receiving this, we're literally praying for you. If you have received it by email or what. And if you... Uh, if we don't know you, please contact us on Facebook or otherwise. We'd love to talk with you. So I have a precious and fruitful Father's Day today. Let's celebrate our dads in one way or another in a phone call or a visit. Um, drink up the barbecue. Uh, we hope you have just a wonderful and a blessed day. Mm -hmm.